Hello there, my fellow mythologians and monster hunters, and welcome to our lore series focusing on various entities and creatures from folklore. Today, though, is a special occasion, as we're gonna talk about an individual creature which definitely existed in real life, with the caveat that a definite explanation was never given or discovered. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Beast of Gévaudan. Before I get started though, a relatively small disclaimer. I do not speak French, and this video is as French themed as they come, so I do apologize in advance if I butcher or mispronounce some names. That being said, I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? In the 1760s, nearly 300 people were killed in a remote region of south-central France called the Gévaudan. The killer was thought to be a huge animal, which became known simply as the Beast. But while the creature's name was simple, its reputation became very complex indeed. Eyewitness accounts of the Beast yield a motley specimen a patchwork of traits and features from wolves, lions, hyenas, bears, dogs, and even panthers. By all accounts though, the beast was huge. Many witnesses compared it in size to a horse or a calf. The beast's hair varied in color. Usually its base coat was a reddish brown, but its markings varied from a black stripe down its spine to patches of gray hair to spots on its hindquarters. It had long, vicious fangs and claws unlike any of the known predators of the region. Some witnesses claimed that the claws were melded together into some kind of hoof. The head of the beast was flatter and its snout was more like a pig than a wolf. Its ears were small and round. It had a wide, cavernous chest, narrow hips and a long tail, thin but very powerful. According to some witnesses, the beast could use its tail as a weapon to knock men off their feet. During the hunts, the hunters produced up to six very different bodies. These were usually about 150 pounds and resembled very large wolves. The two most credible ones were stuffed, examined by a surgeon, and even presented at royal court. The beast was not feared just because of its terrible power, but also because of its unusually brutal hunting technique. Although it did prefer to strike victims when they were alone, it was clearly unafraid of adult humans. Its attacks almost always came as a complete surprise. It would appear suddenly from a bush or drop down on the victim from above, and it seemed it also preferred broad daylight to hunting rather than the cover of night typical to most predators. It used its claws to devastating effect, much more than the typical wolf but its signature death blow was to tear out the victim's throat or crush their skulls entirely. Chillingly enough, the beast also seemed to hunt for pleasure as much as for hunger. Over time, the beast proved equally talented at playing the hunted rather than the hunter. It was a master of evasion. Just when the hunters thought they had it cornered, it would simply disappear. It also seemed to be unaffected by regular bullets. Many people of Gévaudan believed that the creature had helpers in its dirty work as well. Some of the victims were killed at the same time in multiple places, and some witnesses even reported seeing it in the company of a mate, a cub, or even a man. This last report, coupled with the fact that the beast was sometimes seen wearing armor made out of hogskin, led villagers to believe that it was a trained attack animal, rather than a simple predator. The Rampage of the Beast of Gévaudan was one of the very first international news stories. First breaking in the courier of nearby Avignon, it was quickly taken up by the papers of Paris, and from there spread abroad. A German print from September 1764 shows the beast, looking more like a quadrupedal kangaroo than a wolf or a hyena, attacking an improbably well-dressed man in a rather Teutonic-looking landscape. Overall, the beast's paws are bloodied by the death of anywhere between 50 to 300 people. Men, women and children in the region of Gévaudan. The very first attack took place in the summer of 1764, 
when it attacked a woman tending out to her cattle. Fortunately, the herd of the woman included several bulls, who managed to fend off the beast. But the next victim, a 14-year-old child, was not as lucky. Within months, the monster had claimed so many lives that mass hysteria began to settle in. The hysteria was further fueled by the beast's reputation for striking anytime, anywhere. Although it did prefer lone shepherds, it was also documented attacking villagers while they worked in a public garden, shopping at a great spring fair, and even priests and monks inside an abbey. Public hysteria reached a climax in 1765, when the beast attacked a group of seven armed men. Although the men survived, the audacity of this attack brought the beast to the king's attention. But despite the king's wrath, the beast's reign of terror would continue on until June 1767. Soon after the beast's killing spree began, local men began taking up arms against the monster that plagued them. In less than six months, the men had declared all-out war against the local wolf population, forming large hunting parties called Beats. In total, these hunting parties would kill more than 100 wolves before the hysteria subsided. King Louis also deployed a dragoon captain, known as Jean-Baptiste du Hamel, and a number of royal troopers. Yet neither the swarms of hunters, nor du Hamel, nor the pair of professional wolf hunters Louis sent after du Hamel were able to track down the animal responsible. In October of 1764, Captain du Hamel organized the soldiers into one of the largest hunting parties ever trailing the creature. Fifty-seven men took part in this project, but the beast evaded all of them. Their failure, however, served only to incite even more hunters across the nation. Soon, a large reward was offered on the beast's hide, and hunters were flocking into the region to join the sport. Among these hunters, in the summer of 1765, was Deneval, a famous wolf hunter also sent by the king. Deneval also brought his legendary bloodhounds to track the monster, but after witnessing the death of several people, Deneval ran away from the province. Finally, the king sent his own personal gun carrier, Francois Antoine, to bring the beast to justice. For several months, Antoine merely studied the landscape and the habits of the monster. And then, on September 20th, 1765, Antoine and a party of 40 men and a dozen bloodhounds brought the monster to bay near the Abbey of Chazé. Incredibly, the beast survived the first volley of bullets and staggered back to its feet, ready to attack again. But the second, even larger volley brought it down for good. The body was stuffed and presented to the king in the royal court. For three months, the countryside enjoyed a break from the grisly killings, which had plagued it for more than a year. Although Antoine had also killed the wolf's similarly enormous mate and cub, the attacks continued. But by now, the royal court was getting bored of it. The story had played itself out, and public attention had moved on to other matters. And then, in December of 1765, the beast, or another beast, emerged to play again. This monster continued killing well into 1767, when a party of 300 hunters finally sent it to its grave. Among these hunters was a local farmer and innkeeper known as Jean Chastel, who encountered the beast alone and fired two silver bullets into its chest, silencing it forever. Maybe even more than it grips the imagination of the paranormal fiction fans, the beast fascinated historians and cryptozoologists alike. Unlike many other mythological creatures, which cannot really exist in real life, the monster that ravaged Jevodan comes with a solid historical record. There's no doubt that something was responsible for all the killing, and scholars love to speculate about the identity of that something. Until more recently, the most popular story explained the creature as a wolf-dog hybrid. If a wolf mated with a particularly big dog, like a mastiff, the offspring would have several of the beast's described traits, namely the size, the thin tail, and the reddish coat. He might also have the beast's peculiar disposition, which combined the wolf's predatory bloodlust with a dog's lack of fear of humans. 
More recent evidence have pointed to a striped hyena or a pack of hyenas. These animals were fairly common in menageries of the period, collections of wild exotic animals kept by very wealthy individuals. The son of Jean Chastel was said to keep hyenas in a menagerie near Gévaudan. Stuffed hyenas, dating back to the early 18th century, have also been found in nearby museum collections. Although the striped hyena definitely isn't the size of a horse, it has stripes, a broad chest, and a flat head, which do match physical descriptions of the beast. National Geographic also weighed in on the mystery of the beast. In September 2016, they named a young male lion as the culprit, claiming that the lion was the perfect match for the beast's physical description and the hunting style. Lions can weigh up to 800 pounds, almost 10 times as a regular wolf. They have reddish fur, and when they are young might even have stripes down their backs or spots on the haunches. Their tails are long, thin, and tasseled and their heads are flat, with small round ears. They are also experts in stalking prey without being seen, even in broad daylight, and they frequently leap on their victim and crush their throats and heads. Arguably the most chilling theory is that the beast was not just a simple predator. It may have also been someone's pet. The fact that the beast killed without eating the victims, and was sometimes seen wearing armor, or in the company of a man, suggests that it might have been trained to kill. Many scholars pointed fingers at Jean Chastel himself, whose heroism was widely celebrated after he was mysteriously able to kill the creature when dozens and dozens of other hunters couldn't. It is known that the son of Chastel kept a menagerie, so he would have had access to wild animals. Chastel's character is also called into question by his imprisonment during the 1760s for misleading some of the king's men into a swamp, where they all almost died. Chastel may have also been motivated to breed and train the beast as a cover-up for his own murderous impulses, or he may have used the beast as a way to gain personal glory and wealth. During the reign of the beast, many artistic renderings were made of it, both to warn the public about it and to aid hunters in identifying it. It was a regular character in newspapers and wanted posters alike. Since its demise though, the beast has become a famous figure in werewolf lore. Now, werewolf movies have been kind of a dime a dozen over the last few decades, but I would like to recommend a movie which deals directly with this creature. It is titled Brotherhood of the Wolf, it is a 2001 French language movie, but it is quite a big budget production and definitely well made. And I would definitely recommend you watch it if you'd like a more cinematic depiction of this story. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the famous Beast of Gévaudan for today. In my opinion, it is definitely a story that incites the imagination. The best reason for that, to me, is the fact that there are enough concrete facts known about it to prove it was actually real, but enough unexplained and unknown factors to definitely give it a supernatural allure. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this retrospective, if you will, of what this creature was all about. Did you know about the Beast of Gévaudan until today? What do you think was this animal in actuality? Do share your thoughts and theories in the comments below if you wish. If you enjoyed the video, also please click the like button, share it, and subscribe for future content. Thanks a lot for watching, this is GDN signing off.